stretching from the Nullarbor Plain and running for 5,500 kilometres, almost to the Queensland coast, Australia's dog fence is the longest barrier ever built. It's there to keep dingoes out of the pastoral zones in the southeastern part of the continent. The fence runs through some of the most arid and inhospitable parts of the outback. But the past few wet years have brought extra challenges to the men responsible for its upkeep. Tim Lee journeyed to far western Queensland to meet two of the boundary riders on their daily and often lonely vigil. These are the men with the sun-tanned faces and the far-sighted eyes. The men of the open spaces and the land where the mirage lies. Those lines, written by outback poet Will Ogilvy a century ago, still ring true. Mock Parker has one of the loneliest jobs in the nation, in one of the remotest regions. Twice a week, Mock Parker leaves a plume of dust on his bone-jarring run over gibber plains and shifting sand dunes, mostly in a seemingly endless, dead straight line following a high perimeter fence. It's not just any fence, it's Australia's famed dog fence. And Mock Parker is one of its maintenance men, a modern day boundary rider. 10 miles east of Hungerford and from Hungerford to Hamilton Gates, so about 70 mile, 110 k, something like that. And how often would you do this patrol? Uh, this one they like you to do it twice weekly and depending on, um, might be out a bit more than that, depending on weather conditions, a bit of rain or what sort of order the fence in. Like when we went through that creek back there, after the water goes through the fence, you make sure all the aprons are back down again and that type of thing. But at least twice a week I'm out here, yeah. The fence is a crucial barrier. Not simply because this stretch marks the border between Queensland and New South Wales, but because if it didn't exist, pastoralists say they could never run sheep on the immense rangelands of western New South Wales. It's called the dog fence or dingo fence because its main aim is to exclude Australia's native dog, the feared and destructive enemy of the sheep farmer. The fence is 1.8 metres or six feet high and at a staggering 5,412 kilometres in length, it's the longest fence in the world. It runs through all manner of harsh outback terrain, meaning that its upkeep is a never-ending task for the maintenance men. Today, Mock Parker is visiting Hamilton Gate, a mere pinprick on the map, and the depot of fellow fence maintenance man, Glenn Coddington. Minutes before, he's had a reminder of the enemy at close quarters. Glenn, you've got a bit of drama here this morning. Just explain what, uh, what happened. Yeah, I was uh, inside and I heard a bit of a howl and I rushed in and grabbed a rifle and walked out and I see a dog on this side of the fence, which is pretty rare. So, yeah, I dealt with him pretty quick. And that's the evidence there, just yeah, uh, that's, that's the evidence. So you've taken the scalp. This is uh, the yeah. proof you've, uh, you've got it or did yeah. you get a bounty on that? Or? Yeah, that's a $10 bounty. And Bulu for him. So what's the story there? Big big dog? Yeah, real big male dog. Probably because I've got a female dog here myself. But yeah. They, uh, not very often I see him here around this close to the house, but they do turn up now and again. So you'll dry that off and uh, take that in and present that and uh, get yeah. your bounty? Yeah, yeah. Ten dollars, it's not much, but it's something. A dingo on the New South Wales side of the fence is rare but not unheard of, especially in a year such as this. The big summer rains have brought trouble. Flooding can rupture the fence or weaken its defences. It'll rust the bottom wire out eventually and that just create a lot of work for us, which it already has, like we've been through that, the floods already and the wire now is starting to just rust off at ground level, which makes it easy for the worm and the pigs and everything to get through. Boggy ground has stopped Glen Coddington heading west for near on a month. 
Queensland fence. Mock Parker is here to lend a hand. It's called the Black Flat and it's really wet at the moment. I've had a couple of goes in my other work unit, as you can see, and I haven't done real good. But I'm going to try and get this little Suzuki through and leave her on the other side so I've got transport then. With the weather the way it's been, like, even though it's been windy, we just haven't had the heat to dry it out. It's been here for a fair while now, actually. All the joys of fencing in the wet. Have a crack at it and just, I suppose, just go into a reasonably steady first or second gear yeah. and low range and just see what happens. And some of these clay pans, like we come back through there before, and once you cut a track here, it'd be the hard stuff, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. But this, this black gun, is yeah, just, just bottomless at the moment. Basically bottomless, yeah. Hopefully I don't hit too much more water up further. We don't know until we get there. I'll um, go through uh, Thursday. I've got a leading hand coming through from the other way. So that way if anyone gets stuck, we've got two vehicles in. A run of wet years is a rare occurrence in this marginal region. It's reflected in the size of the pastoral leases, among the biggest in Australia. And this year's flush with grass and vegetation. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? And everything's beautiful. gone to seed, so they've done really well. Fence has had a bit of a cane because we've had two, three wet summers in a row. Right, yeah. Not extremely big floods, around, but which has been very good for local landowners. The water seems to run really slow through this country. Maybe now we've got so much grass, it's holding it back. In the drought, it would have been just unbelievable. It just would have flooded everywhere. You'd imagine this country when there's nothing on it. She drifts a bit, yeah, she, she's yeah. pretty barren. She's all sand hill country, basically all my run. So I get a fair bit of drift from the sand. Builds up against the fence, and buck bush, roly poly. It's another real doozy. It gets up against the fence and the wind blows the fence over. It's like hanging a sheet against the fence, so the force of the wind blows the fence down. The Great Barrier Fence, built in the 1880s, originally aimed to halt the rabbit plague sweeping northwards. It failed to do that, but over time it was upgraded and extended to exclude wild dogs from the arid zones, entering the more fertile grazing country of the southeastern part of the continent. If they didn't have uh, this fence, I think they wouldn't be a sheep in New South Wales. So, yeah, it's very important. I think the fence was actually made dog-proof from about 1919 or 1920 or something, and we're still maintaining it today, so there's a reason for it. Like, if it wasn't doing its job, it wouldn't be here. The fence snakes its way from Nundru on the Nullarbor Plain to where the borders of Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia meet at Cameron's Corner. And it continues all the way to Jimbor on Queensland's Darling Downs. There are about two dozen boundary riders like Mock Parker and Glenn Connington, half of them along the New South Wales sections. Each has their respective stretch of fence to look after. I go about 90 kilometres, but I'm cut off now by the bullery, which is uh, about 18 kilometres wide still at the moment. I've got plenty of water to do it with. You've got to be pretty capable. You get a lot of challenges at times. A bit of mechanic work and a bit of welding, so you've got to have a few skills. But it's a good job. Mock Parker has spent all his working life out here. Was a local publican in nearby Hungerford and as a station worker. He laments that there are less people in the outback these days. Low wool prices and drought have taken a gradual toll. But he says that without the dog fence, there'd be even fewer people. The reason Emi is fairly hard on it, but probably pigs, because once they get in under it and lift it, they're probably the worst. And livestock, you don't have much trouble with cattle, sheep, or goats. Or that type of thing, unless there's two bulls want to have a fight either side of the fence or something. The netting and the twitches that join it can rust and break. And on the saline lakes, the salt can make short work of wire netting. The thicker grass cover of a good season can make it harder to spot holes. And there are more holes than normal because the ground is softer. Well, probably a row or... or a... Pig, bit of moisture still here. Uh, work at it, see a bit of a scratch around, push and push and push until he pushes himself once they get their nose or their head through. And of course it's weak because it's probably been sitting in water for 
some weeks before this puddle hole dried out. There's probably water up to about here. As you can see, the rust line here, they're probably just pushing through here, think they're going to get a bit of a drink. But it's, it's a weak patch because of the rust. That's why it's, it's you know, got this bit heavier gauge stuff here on it. And we tie these logs and that on it and, and weight it with stones. Because when there's a bit of a heavy rain that rushes through, it allows that to lift rather than flattening the fence. And it's better to come back and put that back in place and put another weight on it rather than have to stand up three or four panels of fence laying right down. As you can see, here there's a couple of different bits of netting. Over the years they, they rust because of the water. Look at these fellas here. The water's life here eh, in the bush. All they've got left is one little hole. She's full of tadpoles. There could be about 100 tadpoles in that little hole. Technology has partly eased the sense of isolation and solitude. You know, we're well into the Millennium 2000, so the vehicles are better and more reliable, and we're supplied with HF radio, so which is a bit of a necessity in case there's a bit of a problem. Things like uh, grab a snake on the fence or something, get a snake bite, at least you've got pretty reliable communications. So I suppose it's company, but um, mostly these little dogs have got a bit of Jack Russell or fox terrier in them. They're, they're pretty good with snakes. They don't attack them or kill them, okay. but they certainly let you know if they're about. And of course, it's pretty quiet out here. And, and she's always trotting around, and you can, if she's got a different type of growl, you know there's a snake about. So. I'm pretty windy of snakes. Especially if you're down low trying to fix a fence. Yeah, yeah and with that, it's not a problem. I shouldn't, shouldn't say there's any sort of a problem, but you never know. Chance in a million if she just happens to bark at the right time and saves you getting bitten, well, that's, that's a plus. Most would find the remoteness overpowering, not these men. I'm pretty lucky. I live in a town that's got seven people in it. He lives out here on his own, so you know, if I get a bit, bit that way inclined, I can, can always find someone to say good day to. But poor old Glenn out here, he's, unless his wife's there with him, he spends a hell of a lot of time on his own. So, so he's have to um, really knuckle down to be used to a bit of isolation. Yeah. Like being in the bush. That's mainly why I come out here. Uh, country lifestyle's really good. I don't mind being by myself. Quite interesting, really, being out here. And the women folk, how does your wife... Yeah, you she know? handles it, but, yeah, she's in Dubbo at the moment, having a break. And I can't blame her, because we're stranded here for a fair while. But, yeah, she gets used to it. It's probably not something that everyone would take on, I wouldn't think, as a job. You've got to really want to be here and accept where we are. 